Coming up on Exploring St. Paul, I go to St. Paul's Cathedral and look up the entire time. I have a drink or two on a tour of Summit Brewery, and I get to feel like a giant at the Model Railroad Museum. All of this and more on Exploring St. Paul. I'm here with Carl Simmons, one of the archivists who's a volunteer here at the cathedral. And uh, Carl, just explain, sort of explain, like, what is a cathedral? What, what is it about this that makes it a cathedral? Well, the cathedral, the word cathedral, comes from cathedra, which is a Greek word that means chair. And if we look up in the, up the sanctuary on the left-hand side, we'll see a chair in front of those red velvet curtains. And the bishop, the archbishop here lives right across the street. And you can say that in, in basic that the cathedral means the home of the bishop and the bishop lives across the street. If you have a group of people, the person that's in charge is called a chair, a chairwoman, a chairman, and the bishop's in charge of the Catholics in this area, which includes the 12 counties of the metropolitan area. Now a basilica, which we have in Minneapolis, the Basilica of St. Mary, it is just, in, in the Catholic Church, it just means a large, important church. It does have a designation as a co-cathedral, mm -hmm. but there are some functions that can be performed over there, but the major functions in the church are performed right here in the cathedral, like when priests are ordained, mm -hmm. they're ordained right here at the cathedral. When they come to the Cathedral of St. Paul, they, they sort of think that this is the original cathedral. Well, it's right. not the original cathedral. It's the fourth cathedral of St. Paul. The other three cathedrals were all in downtown St. Paul. The first one was nothing more than a log cabin that built in October 1841. And it's between the Wabasha and the Robert Street Bridge. And the day it would be between Kellogg Boulevard and uh, the bluff that goes drops down mm -hmm. into the river. Uh, a few years later, in 1851, the second cathedral was built, and it was on uh, the corner of Sixth and Wabasha. And then in 1858, the third cathedral was built right next door at Sixth and on St. Peter. They were in that cathedral from 1858 until they came here in 1915, when this cathedral was first opened. Now this cathedral, the fourth cathedral of St. Paul, was. Uh, it took nine years to build. It was started in 1906, and it was finished in 1915. They thought they could build it for 1.3 million. It cost 1.65 million in 1905 dollars. And when it finally got done, it was complete on the outside, but totally incomplete on the inside. On the outside is granite from uh, Rockville, Minnesota, right next to uh, Cold Springs, Minnesota. And the inside is American travertine from Mankato, Minnesota. How old are these pews? Well, the pews were installed in 1914. So, so 101 100, years one, old. 101 years. Yep. And they are, they're original to the, to the cathedral. In these pews, you will see little clips. Most people don't have any idea what the clips are for. But a hundred years ago, gentlemen wore hats almost all the time. And so when you came to church, the men took off their hats and where did they put them? They clipped them under the clip. A lot of the pews had brass plates on them and there you would rent the pew. And so when you came to church on Sunday, then you had a pew that you had rented. And some of the pews, we don't do that anymore, but a few of the pews still have the, the brass plates. So one of the things I noticed upon, you know, when I look a little bit closer here at yeah. the pews, I noticed that there's these uh, metal grates that are underneath. Can you tell me a little bit more about what those are and what they do? Well, that's how heat got in the building in the wintertime. Uh, in, a, in a separate building next, next to the cathedral is the furnace room. Uh, stoves, and they would generate the heat, and at the time, they were coal. Almost everything was heated by coal, and so, <clears throat> The heat was piped over here underground, and then it came up through these grills. Now, when the cathedral was finished in 1915, of course,
course, we had heat, but we didn't have air conditioning because air conditioning wasn't invented until maybe 20 years later. Mm -hmm. So in the summer, it can get a little toasty in here, but in the winter, it's nice and warm. And of course, those cold fired uh, uh, furnaces are now natural gas. One of the rooms you see when you first walk in is the Founders Chapel with the statue of Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary. This little room in the back of the narthex or the entryway back here is called the Founders Chapel. And it's called the Founders Chapel for just one reason. And it's this large book that we see here, this, it's vellum. And it has the names of every person that contributed as little as one dollar to build a cathedral a hundred years ago. This statue was going to be making a, a trip around the United States to various Catholic churches and it was here for Lent, and it was up by the sanctuary, by the main altar. And it was here for Lent, and it was here for a few more weeks, and a few more weeks, and pretty soon our pastor announced that an anonymous member of the parish had purchased it and had donated it to the cathedral. Our pastor at the time had spent a decade in Rome, and he said, gee, you go into St. Peter's in Rome, and where do you see the real Pieta? You go in the door, and you immediately turn to the right. So when we walk into the main doors of the cathedral here, we immediately turn to the right. So let's move back here. So who did it? Michelangelo. Pietà, passion. And he was 23 years old when he carved this. He was an unknown sculptor. And when he did it, they thought a young 23-year-old Italian man couldn't do this. It had, so they attributed it to other sculptors, famous Italian sculptors. Well, if I were Michelangelo, that would have upset me. So he took a chisel, and it's the only thing that he ever put his name on. And he came up here on the sash of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he put his name on there. Well, you can really, Michelangelo. really see that right there. In the back left part of the sanctuary is the Virgin Mary Chapel, one of the most visited spots in the cathedral. This is the most visited of all of the chapels in the cathedral. This is to the Blessed Virgin Mary. If you look at the windows in here, they're very beautiful. We look at the statue of Mary, she looks quite young. The biblical historians think that she was about 15 years old when she had her Lord. Now, <clears throat> when I'm in here, two things strike me. Our Lord was a God, and I, did, I didn't think of him as having grandparents, but his mother had parents, and there's her, there her father, St. Joachim, over here on the side. And this is her mother up here, St. Anne. One of the most famous pews in the sanctuary was a pew sat in by none other than John F. Kennedy. This is what it says. Let me get down here and read it. In memory of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who occupied this pew during... During the 11 o'clock Mass, Sunday, 7 October, 1962. And so oh, he probably yeah. sat... Right there. Right here. And there is, is a plug in right there where the sermon was preached. Looking right there. So obviously, you know, the cathedral's really big. There's a lot of detail in inside and outside. Um, what cultural significance do you think that the cathedral as a whole plays into the community in St. Paul? Well, a lot of the, the original immigrants that came here, because St. Paul is older, they came from France. Uh, they came from German, Germany, uh, and so St. Paul had, at the time, a, quite a number of Catholics here, and uh, there's still quite a few Catholics in, in St. Paul. And I think that when you come to church here during the week, I mean, I'm sorry, on Sundays, I have been told that about a third of all the people here are visitors, and they live in the outlying communities around here and they want to bring their friends and it's uh, it, it's just a it's just a beautiful building and when I walk in uh, this all this this art that's in here the statues the the mosaics that we have and all of these things just kind of help people raise their hearts and minds to God it's just a, it's just a very beautiful building I still feel humbled when I, when I come I want to thank you, Carl, for giving us a very, I guess, detailed 
thorough tour, very informative. Um, and I, I, yeah, I guess I would encourage anybody oh, uh, to come here. We have uh, at least 200,000 visitors that come through here every year. People from all over the world, from all religions come through here. And, uh, the, all, and all are welcome. Well, thank you very much, Carl. Okay, you're nice welcome. Nice meeting you. I'm here at Summit Brewery, and I'm here with one of the brewers, Eric Harper. And Eric, just tell me, what it, what are these copper containers, and why is it so warm in there? So this is where we're actually, um, you know, brewing the beer. Mm -hmm. um, these copper kettles, uh, we are they're from Germany. They were built in 1971, and this is where uh, the main part of the brewing process happens. So in these kettles, the uh, first one is called the mash tun. It's okay. actually through that the doorway there. Okay. Yep, uh, that's where we're mixing water and the crushed grain, malted barley, um, and that's like the consistency of oatmeal. Um, we call that the mash. And then basically at different temperatures, um, enzymes are converting the starches in the, in the grain into sugar. And so we're gonna use that sugar later in fermentation. Uh, the yeast is gonna convert it to alcohol and carbon dioxide. How many different beers do you guys brew here? We brew around 15 beers between our year rounds and seasonals. Then, of course, there's uh, Unchained and Union Series beers. On a typical, uh, I guess, tour of the brewery here, is this where you guys would pretty much start here, right here? Yep, so the tour meets here in uh, our Rat Skeller, we call it, or the beer hall. Um, basically, you get a short presentation about the history of Summit Brewing Company, some information about the different beers that we brew, and. Uh, brewing process and then they'll take you around different areas and at the end you get to sample three free beers. So and I get to sample the beer yes. myself. Yes, yes okay. of course. And that that's just the whole reason why we do this, why I did this just just to get the free beer. <laughs> Wait, so do people do people have to pay for the beer at the end of the tour? No, the tour is free, but we do encourage a food donation for Second Harvest Heartland. With beer on my mind, we start the tour by going through the bottling line. Well, we're right in the room next to the bottling line, and unfortunately we can't go in there and talk about it because it's just so loud we can't hear ourselves. Um, so we're in the room right next to it with these huge containers. But uh, Eric, just tell me a little bit about the bottling line. What goes on in there? How many bottles do you guys uh, bottle, I guess? Sure. Um, well, we package all of our beer here on site. Um, and the bottling line uh, typically packages about 450 bottles of beer per minute. Uh, and in a day, we'll make about 8,000 cases of beer. I noticed when we were walking through, the beer that you were packaging was Finnegan beer. Is that a Summit beer? So Finnegan's isn't a Summit brand, but we brew it under contract. And of course, then all the sales uh, proceeds from Finnegan's go to local charities. So I noticed standing in this room, I can't help but notice these just huge containers. Tell me, what are, what are these containers? Where, where all these pipes go? Sure. So this room is our new fermentation cellar. And there are 12 uh, stainless steel fermenters. Each one holds four batches of beer. So each batch is 150 barrels of beer, or about 300 kegs. Um, so that's 600 barrels of beer. Uh, it's around 200,000 bottles of beer, if you want to think of it that way, in each tank. Do you ever get to sample any of that beer? Do you ever, how much beer do you get to have it on that? Um, well, sure, like the quality control, quality assurance staff um, in our laboratory are sampling various tanks daily, like throughout the process, um, just to make sure they're up to our standards. Um, we do have a taste panel where we're reviewing our beers uh, every morning at about 9 a.m. Is there like some sort of like special like taste palate that you have to have when tasting beer? Um, there are some people that have better palates than others uh, so you might call them a super taster but everybody in the brewery is able to be on our tasting panel and you can be trained basically to look for certain beer characteristics that you know we want to identify in our products. What do you look for when you're tasting a beer? What sort of flavors are you looking for? Um, most of the time, if it's in our taste panel, we're looking for, say, staling characteristics to see how well our beer ages out in the marketplace. Um, so we'll age beer and then taste that versus fresh beer and, you know, try and figure out, okay, what does our beer taste like when it gets old? This sort of looks like just like 
one, like a chemistry class on steroids. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty neat in here. Yeah. It's all fully automated. Um, so you don't really see any hoses or anything. Everything is is permanently piped. We call it hard piped with a stainless seal. So uh, basically down at the end, there's a, what we call a valve matrix. And anything going in or out of the tanks um, basically is controlled down at the end of each row. This cluster of red and green dots controls the flow of liquid being pumped from those big tanks. If you can think each tank in the row, uh, like a row of valves is basically for one tank. Okay. So there's four tanks, four rows of valves. And then you say, okay, um, we have wort coming from the brew house. That's the, the sweet liquid, sweet sugary liquid we call wort. Okay. Um, it's coming this way in this pipe. And this will be the first tank in the row here. Okay. And so it kind of intersects, right? And if the valve opens, you can see how they're situated one on top of another like in a in a cross right when the valve opens then basically whatever's coming this way in the pipe can then go that way down the intersection and into the tank bottom okay so you can go in or out um, and then basically you know these pipes are different different streams this is a catwalk view of the room next door with the very important filtering device yeah that's the centrifuge okay so that will remove yeast and solids from the beer and from there, it goes uh, through that big white rectangle that's a uh, filter. Okay. So those are sheets, filter sheets. Um, and then the filter beer goes into those last four tanks. Um, that, so those are called bright beer tanks. That's where the finished beer goes. You can't make all this beer without one crucial ingredient. Wait, these are hop? These hops. are hop, yeah, hop pellets. So we'll yep. add these to the boiling wort. It kind of looks like rat poison like, or rabbit food <laughs> yeah maybe. yeah yeah no nope. um so the hops you know add bitterness to the yeah. beer and obviously uh different hop varieties have distinct aromas whether it's you know kind of the citrusy grapefruity smells or right you know some more earthy do you do you make the hops here or you do you get them from someplace else? no uh so we buy our hops most of the hops that we're using are grown in the pacific northwest okay like, Washington, Oregon State. Okay. Um, and then of course we're importing hops um, from England, Czech Republic, and Germany, places okay. like that. With the tour finally over, I get to have what I really came so for. Works. What what beers are you gonna let me try here? You can try any of the beers you'd like. Okay. Except for apparently Saga. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> change the cake. Hmm. <laughs> you could try our new hop fail, that's our 100%, wait, it's not 100%, sorry. You could try uh, hop fail, that's our organic ale, it's brand new, year round, um, brewed with organic malts, hops, and organic lemon peel. Okay, I'll, go, I'll take one of that. I'm all about the organic. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any sort of technique to this drink? It? Um, yeah, I guess it depends on how much you, uh, <laughs> how much you want to, you know, analyze it, I guess, <laughs> but. It has a, like a sort of like IPA-ish yeah, sort of taste to it. Definitely, um, we, we're calling it a session IPA, so it's lower in alcohol, but hopped like an IPA, so really, um, Highly hopped, very bitter, dry hop it. Then we're also adding that uh, lemon peel. Yeah, it's, so you get kind of a lemon yeah, yeah, taste. Yeah. It tastes pretty good. Eric, I want to thank you for uh, spending some of your time with us, learning about brewery and how to brew beer and letting it taste some beer. Um, thank you. Um, and when when do people when do you usually have tours here? Um, tours are uh, Tuesday through Thursday at 3 p.m. and Saturdays. Uh, there are three tours and I'd have to look up uh, the exact hours, um, but you can check our website for details. Summitbrewery.com. Summit and you can make a reservation for a tour online. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for coming by. I'm here with Paul Grutzman, one of the model railroad engineers here at the Model Railroad Museum. And Paul, just sort of tell me about like the history of model railroading, like what made it so popular? Well, I think everybody is interested in trains mm -hmm. and uh, of course building models or having toy trains is one way to 
get involved with it. I think most of us started out with a toy train set and for a few people it becomes a lifelong hobby. How many different sort of trains that you have here? Well, primarily what we have on this railroad are all O-scale models and uh, uh, it works out to a quarter inch to a foot so you can build buildings and figure out what size they're supposed to be. Do you make the trains here or do you order them from someplace else? Uh, both. Um, some of our members build their own from scratch, some from kits, and some of the locomotives you either buy from a hobby shop or, you know, from a mail order business or something like that. Being at the train museum, I couldn't stop myself from wanting to play with the trains. All right, I'm gonna push this button. That train's gonna go. Yeah. There, now you're an official volunteer. <laughs> That's cool. So tell me, how do you um, plan all of this, the, what, the landscaping out and the tracks out? Um, we had one person as an architect and he ended up drawing everything out. And then he'd sit down with a group of people and we kind of decided, you know, what we'd like to see incorporated in the railroad, so he'd go back and redraw it again, and mm -hmm. this is the result of a lot of a lot of work and cooperation. But we wanted to have a railroad that was entertaining for people to watch and historically significant. So I think we've done pretty good of both. What does the inspiration for this little town come from? Because I see you have Mickey's Diner. Is this like an early version of St. Paul? Uh, this is kind of a freelance town. Uh, the fellow that built this liked to drive around the countryside and found unique buildings and then he'd draw them up and build a model of it. And so we got it all incorporated in here. Uh, some of the buildings I recognize, like the church that's there, um, that was in the first movie Grumpy Old Men. Okay. And the two houses next to it, uh, they were also in that movie. Tell me a little bit about like the people and the little details. Do you like to make craft those little models here? Yeah, I, th I, th <clears throat> I think that's part of what tells the story is the, having people from the same period and vehicles and uh, that adds to the interest. We try to model the 1940s and 50s here and so generally this st stuff reflects that. What's the trickiest part about putting all this together? Keeping it working. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of maintenance involved. We've been here for 30 years, so some of these trains have been running close to that long, and they do require a lot of maintenance. They're, they're built as models for a model home operator, but mm -hmm. we run them six days a week here. The Model Train Museum has different landscapes on display, like cities, small towns, and rural areas. So I noticed that you like to have a lot of like nature um, and the scenery of the trains. Tell me a little bit like how, what you make the grass and trees and mountains out of. Well, we'll start with the front here. The river is actually made out of a two-part epoxy type material. It's called Envirotex Light. Okay. And then the tracks are laid on a real solid plywood base. And then we, we use uh, plaster and screens and stuff like that. Uh, put the pla uh, paper towels into the plaster and then form it over the top. And then once that hardens, then you put whatever kind of scenery you want on top. And here we have some rocks. Okay. That, uh, are those real rocks? Yeah, these are actually real rocks. Up behind here is imitation grass. Okay. Uh, the railroad ballast uh, is actually roofing granules. Huh. And then uh, the different types of trees uh, some of these were handmade. Actually, the tall pines were made by uh, a museum as a fundraiser up in Pine, uh, Pine County. And uh, they make these trees and sell them, and then they're using that to fund their model railroad up there. So we bought quite a few from them. And then uh, some artists came in and did the backdrop for us. Uh, the hills, the color of the hills, and all that kind of stuff. One of our members is a taxidermist, so he knows all these kind of little tricks for his for the different scenes. Is there any particular place um, that you drew inspiration from to build this particular set right here? Yeah, this this is um, modeled after if you were to drive down Highway 61 to La Crosse, okay. 
where you see the river and then the tracks and then uh, the highway and bluffs. Yeah, it's very hilly and, down there. Yeah, and that's pretty much the area that we've tried to recreate here. And uh, as you walk around the railroad, like the town we were in before is like a little rural town. And, yeah. and we have the Minneapolis skyline. And then over on the other end is a lot of the railroad buildings and stuff that were in St. Paul. So we try to blend it all together. So Paul, it looks like we're in a more urban environment over here. Just tell me, what, what is this place that you modeled this off of? Um, this is basically the St. Anthony Falls Milling District as it would have been in the 50s before they put the locks in on the river. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see the Stone Arch Bridge and the Third Avenue Bridge back there. And these railroad bridges are spaced down the river. So it's pretty well um, compressed and modeled to make that area. We got the milling district on the left side of it. And you can see the gold metal flour mill and some of the other buildings. Uh, this power station is still there, and how when you when you model these areas, how much detail do you plan on uh, going into in each model? Well, that varies from model to model. Usually, we try to be quite accurate about it. Uh, we can't model things full size. For example, the Stone Arch Bridge is 14 feet long; it's scaled down. If we built it exactly a quarter inch to the foot it would be 22 feet long, so we wouldn't have room for a whole lot more than the bridge. So, but our guys are pretty good at compressing things so that they're still able to be identified. With all these trains on display, you might be wondering how they control the trains. So Paul, I noticed that you have these little remote controls that you plug in on various parts of the track. Can you just tell me a little bit about those and how you use them to control the trains? Yeah, the ones that we use every day, um, plug in around the railroad, you can unplug it to go to another location if you want, and uh, it controls the speed with this knob and then the direction with the switch on top. So we have one for each track so we can control the trains that way. Does this one controller control just one train? Just the one train, okay. yeah, and that would be track three, which the passenger train is running around on right now. We also have a, a system that we can plug in different controllers because there's more technology becoming available now and rather than use cab 3 right now we're using another digital system so this uses a much different one you can uh, control the whistle mm -hmm. the bell and the speed all independently now I noticed this big gray board with a bunch of lights and a bunch of switches what is this thing? What does it do? This is the main control panel and it controls all the tracks. Okay. So we're able to use different controllers on different sections of track. And uh, this, this area here controls all the trains that come in and out of the passenger uh, station. And the loops that go all the way around, uh, they control all the main lines. And then we have one more panel over there that controls the main yard, and then there's several other smaller panels. Thank you, Paul, so much for showing us all about the model trains and how they work. Um, what's, when, do people, when can people visit the train museum? Uh, we're open six days a week here, uh, closed on Monday like most museums. Uh, on weekends, we do have a, another display in a different building that's only open on weekends, and uh, we're here weekdays um, 10 o'clock till 3 o'clock every day and Saturday is 10 to, to 5 and Sunday is noon to 5. All right thank you very much for showing My us. pleasure. Enjoy sharing my hobby. <laughs> this city has a variety of places to fulfill a variety of needs. A place for spirituality, a place for recreation, and a place for childlike wonder. All of this can be found when exploring St. Paul.